when was the universe ready for Earth? Life on Earth needs water. At what point in the history of the universe after the Big Bang were all the molecules in place needed to create life? I will show that our common perception that aliens are going to come visit us is probably wrong. That we're actually more likely to be us that's going to go visit the aliens. Did you actually know that the United Nations have an office for outer space affairs which have a plan of what we're going to do when the aliens land. Who is going to talk to them? Who is going to find out what it's all about? Who is going to negotiate? So we are prepared for them to come to us. And the big question is, is that the right way to be prepared? So let's look at the evidence. What do we actually know when we look into the universe? So what you see here, on a starry night when you go out, you just see stars and all the blackness. If you have a good telescope and you actually look deep into the Milky Way, you will see that between the stars you often have interstellar clouds. And we see one of them here, which is the Eagle Nebula. And it's called the Eagle Nebula because it, this silhouette that you can see sort of resembles a flying eagle that you can sort of get if you have a bit of imagination. So the Eagle Nebula consists of gas and dust, so the black patches that you see around is actually not missing stars, it's actually little specks of dust which blocks the light from the stars which are there. If we take a closer look at the center of the Eagle Nebula, we see what is called the pillars of creation. They're called that because uh, this is where new stars are formed, so they are center of star formation. When we look at the Eagle Nebula, then the whole nebula is actually 7,000 light years away from us. That means that the light that we observe today has been traveling for 7,000 years before it reaches our telescope. So the picture I show you here is actually a picture of what the nebula looked like 7,000 years ago. What the nebula looks like today, we have to wait another 7,000 years to actually find out. But if we go closer to the pillars of creation, and turn them 90 degrees, so you can see it's the same structure. Then at the top of the pillars, you actually see a shining light. And that shining light is from newly formed stars. So you have stars forming inside these dark pillars of gas and dust. And stars form when such a gas cloud collapses under its own weight, so it gets warm enough in the center that you can get nuclear reactions to occur, which makes the stars shine. And actually, it is such that in this cloud, it is a little blurb like that one that turns into one star, possibly with planets around it. So the whole structure as such is really, really big, and you can make a lot of, lot of stars out of this particular structure. It looks like that it's really dense, right? We can't see very much. But actually, it's only the center of the pillars, which are really dense. At the edge of the pillars, the amount of particles and atoms that you have is actually less than what we can do with the best ultra vacuum in space. So the density is actually very, very low out here. So the reason that it looks like that there is nothing there has to do with that the um, the pillars of creation are so far away. So we have a very, very long sight line. So we look through a huge amount of space, and even though the dust particles are situated more than a meter apart, and the individual hydrogen atoms are also quite far apart, then when we look over such a long sight line, if you have a dust grain here, one here, one here, one here, then suddenly it sort of piles up so that it looks like an uh, opaque mass that you can't see through. But Astronomers, we have fancy telescopes, so if we look in a different wavelength than just the optical light, if we look in what is called the near-infrared, which is a wavelength that can look through the dust, then the same area on the sky looks like this. So this is the exact same area on the sky, and suddenly you see all the stars appear, which was blocked from our sign of light just because of the little specks of dust in our li uh, sight line. You still see the pillars of creation, the black things that you have. This is where star formation, possibly with planets, are going to form. Because here the dust density is high enough that we can imagine that the dust particles will sort of merge into two planets. So when we look at the Milky Way, then the dark patches that we see over the Milky Way, it's not missing stars. It's actually clouds of gas and dust that are blocking the light from the stars which are lying behind it. So the Milky Way is actually a lot more bright than we would imagine. And as we zoom in, we can see that it actually these black patches are actually clouds of gas and dust, as the Eagle Nebula that I showed you before. So interstellar matter matters. 
these little tiny dust grains, there are so many of them that they actually block the light from the Milky Way so much that if there were no dust in the Milky Way, the Milky Way would be a billion times brighter. Imagine what that could do for being out on a starry night if you had this sort of stream of really bright stars. It would be a pretty boring galaxy to live in because it's out of the dust grains that we form planets. So if we didn't have any dust in the Milky Way, we wouldn't have any planets. So when we write the history of the universe, so this is sort of a slide showing you uh, our common view of the history of the universe. So we are sitting out here on the Hubble telescope looking into the universe, and it actually is such that when we look deep into the universe, it's equivalent to looking back in time, because light takes time to travel to us from the distant parts of the universe. So the further away we see an object, the longer time the light has spent to come to us. So that is equivalent to the further away we see something, the more of a youth picture do we see on this of this object, so we effectively see back in time. So we have the Hubble telescope, we look back in time, we see fancy galaxies, and then with our current understanding, the universe is actually 13.7 billion years um, old. And we can see as far back in time as the first light glow that we got uh, from the universe, which was the same time where the two most simple elements, hydrogen and helium, they formed. There's one other point on this timeline which we know really, really well, and that is actually the formation of the solar system. Because we know that the solar system formed 4.56 billion years ago, and the reason we know this is because we have done radioactive dating of rocks from Earth, and rocks from the moon, which the astronaut flew up and picked up, and we have examined them in the laboratory. And then we also have what is called meteorites, which are space, rocks from space that come down so we can examine them in the laboratory, and they give us a very clear indication that the solar system is 4.5 billion years old. So the big question is, we started out with a universe consisting of just hydrogen and helium. We know that nine billion years later, the solar system was ready to form. So it took nine billion years to get things ready for the solar system. So after nine billion years, everything were in place. But could it be that everything had been in place at an earlier time? At what time was the universe, had it formed all the elements needed to form planets like Earth? The way that elements are formed are actually in the interior of the stars. So when you have the original hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang, and you get it into these gas clouds that form stars, then the reason that stars shine are actually because hydrogen and helium is transformed into other elements. So when you have a star, it forms elements, and as the star dies, it expels the element into the interstellar medium, into the gas clouds, from where you can form planets and stars once you've had enough generations of stars um, exploding in the universe so that you get more and more elements. So the universe as such gets more and more enriched in heavy elements or more and more polluted, depending on how you look at it. As time goes by, it starts out very simple, just two elements, and ends up with the whole periodic table. So that means in order to actually answer the question, when was the universe ready for Earth, boils down to understanding how many generations of stars do we need to go through in order for all the elements needed to be created. So just to recap, we have Big Bang, Big Bang from hydrogen and helium. And that formed the first interstellar clouds from where we can form stars. We basically have two kinds of stars in the universe. We have low mass stars, they're there, and high mass stars, which are over here. So let's start with the high mass stars, because they are actually sort of the most fun. So they're very big stars, they're extremely generous because inside the interior, they're so hot that they can form all the elements that we find in the periodic table. Once they have created all the elements, they actually explode in a supernova explosion, which means that all these elements which are created are actually expelled into the stars, so they create all the elements, and they're very generous in giving them back into the interstellar medium. Then we have the low-mass stars. They're not quite as generous. They're smaller stars. They live for very long. They don't do very many elements, and they only give half of the elements back that they produce. So one could wonder why I care about them at all, and the reason that they're interesting in this story is because this is where the carbon and the oxygen is made. So the elements vital for life is probably primarily made in the low-mass stars. When we then look at how many of each star stellar type do we have in the Milky Way in order to map when are the elements formed, then it turns out that the high mass stars we have over here, the generous ones, the ones who could very easily fill up the universe with lots of elements, 
they actually are not very common. So when we observe, we see one supernova explosion per 100 year in a galaxy. So we get one of these stars per 100 year in the galaxy. The low mass guys, the ones that live for long, they live very long, so they're a bit, you know, they keep on to the elements for a long time, but there's a lot of them. So in the Milky Way, there's 200 millions of these tiny guys. So even though they don't give much each, then the sum of a lot actually might add up to quite a bit. So the big question is, when you have these two cycles, the fast one and the slow one, which one is actually the most prominent? And how many of the low mass stars do you need to form carbon in order to have enough carbon for a person like me to be here to form the element that we have? So we have hydrogen and helium, which formed in the Big Bang. Then the low mass stars, they form a few, but vital elements like carbon, oxygen, and, um, and nitrogen. And then the high mass stars, they form everything else. So when we stress as astronomers that we are all made of stardust, then that is actually true. We are cycled through stellar, uh, stellar cycles, and we have some elements from the low mass stars, some elements from the high mass stars. So let's look at how fast did that actually take place in the universe, because in the early, right after Big Bang, our observations show that we have 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. And then, as time has gone by, we today have 74%, 25%. So those of you who are good at math, realizes there's 1% missing. And that means that all the elements from which Earth is created and we are created have only 1% of the original hydrogen has turned into all these elements. So that means, and in order to answer the question, how fast could the universe be, be able to create an Earth, actually boils down to whether we believe that most of the carbon, which is present in my DNA today, was made in high mass stars, which are fast and generous, or in the low mass stars, which are slow uh, and, and give a little bit back on a very long time scales. The Kepler telescope is currently looking at exoplanets, and it has detected 2,000 planets around other stars. Today, to the, until today, only six of these planets have shown to have an age which is larger than the solar system. All the other planets which we've been able to determine the age of are either the same age as the solar system or younger than the solar system. That indicates that our perception that we should be afraid that the aliens are going to come to eat us is actually wrong, because it's actually the aliens that should be worried that we are going to come out and eat them.